Hello, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you who have logged in from different parts of the globe today. Welcome to the sixth edition of Loba Explore. On behalf of Loba and Loyola School, it is my privilege to welcome this audience for our career guidance session. Today, we also have amongst us students from other Jesuit institutions, namely St. Joseph's Junior ICSE School, Kurikod, St. Michael School, Kanur, and AKJM High School, Karnagapalli. We live in a world which is accelerating at a rapid pace, and the advent of COVID-19 re-emphasized the power of technology like never before. Now, with the world at a physical standstill in 2020, it was indeed the digital presence that kept the momentum for commerce to function. Digital transformation leaped 10x. Welcome to the world of AI, ML, and IT. My name is Abhilash Jayapal, a proud Loba explorer and your moderator for the day. I lead an e-commerce consulting startup named Terrific Minds, and we are based out of Technopark in Trivandrum. I also lead the India operations for a healthcare product development startup named OrthoFX. Let me also introduce you to my co-moderator for the day, Vaishayan Bhattacharya, grade 11 student from Loyola School. Well, he is Gen Z, so we decided to keep things really short between us. So he calls me AJ and I call him VB, and together, we're super excited to introduce our amazing panelists who joins us from different parts of the globe today. We have panelists joining us from Bangalore, Pune, Seattle, Boston, and Salt Lake City. Our very own brethren, absolute A players in their respective domains. Vibi, why don't you go ahead and do your intro? Thanks, Sanjay. Welcome everyone. My name is Vaishan Bhattacharya, and I'm tonight's co-moderator. I am a grade 11 student of Loyola School. I'm an av and a fiery football fan and a passionate Python programmer. I'm also a computer science aspirant and I've been introduced to AI and machine learning at school. So I'm really looking forward to tonight's session. But before we move on, let's look at the housekeeping. So the housekeeping for attendees, you know, please send the questions for panelists via the Q&A box. Questions must be short and to the point. Only questions related to career guidance will be discussed today and relevant unanswered questions, not anonymous, will be replied to via email after this session. I just want to put this out there that variety and versatility in today's event resonates with the ever-changing and the fluid IT industry. And like Aja said, we have a distinguished set of achievers amongst us today. So please welcome us, so please join us in welcoming our panel. Thank you, Vivi. So let's welcome our panels today. Uh, we have Basant Rajan, who is the CEO of Coriolis Technologies, and he joins us from Pune. Basant is from the 1984 batch. We have Shajan Dasan, who's joining us from Seattle, and he's from the 1988 batch. He's an ML engineer at Twitter. Shajan, uh, I know it's really early for you out there, and thank you so much for joining in so early from West Coast. Uh, we have Isaac Matthew from the 1990 batch. He's an associate director at Boston Consulting Group Gamma. He joins us from Bangalore. We have Abjit Ashok, who's dropping in from Boston. He's from the 2010 batch, and he works in the AI division of Microsoft. And we also have Krishna Mohan P from the 2010 batch. He's an ML engineer at SafeX AI based in Salt Lake City. Thank you guys for joining us from different time zones. It's indeed our privilege to have you all here. Well, as you all, all know, it is our custom at Loyola to start out every proceeding with something that we consider truly special. Over to you, Vinoy. Abhijit, nothing like hearing the school anthem. That was wonderful. Uh, for those of you who don't know Abhijit, he's a huge music lover and adores playing the electric saxophone. Well, now that we are getting started, let us see who our audience is today. Can I have the first poll question, please? Well, that's about the attendee profile. I would request that the attendees take 10 seconds to click on your answer and select 
the submit button. Let's take 10 seconds. Please remember to select the answer. And if you're on your mobile, please do scroll and select the submit button. All right. All right, so we have the results right now. So we have around 59, 35%. No, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. So we've got quite a, quite a good distribution out here. Well, thank you for that. Can I have the second poll question, please? Again, can you please go ahead and click on your answer and select the submit button. How interested are you or your child in the careers being discussed today? Very interested, interested, not sure. All right, can I have the answers, please? There you go, we have a good distribution, very interested, scores the highest, interested, and we have a good healthy distribution there. That's nice, thank you very much, Binoy. All right, so you know, let's get going with some tech talk. Over to you, Vibi. Thanks, AJ. So let's start with Krishna here. Krishna, you are one of our youngest panelists here, and you work with an exciting AI startup. What's your story? What kind of work do you do? So uh, thanks, guys, for the great intro. Uh, so I did not start as a data scientist or in the machine learning. I actually didn't even start in computer science. I started with electrical and electronics engineering, and then did a bunch of computer architecture and GPU architecture and stuff like that. But somewhere in the middle of my master's degree, I got introduced to AI and ML through some of my courses. But what really inspired me was a project I did for a startup uh, back at Rutgers University. It was started by one of our professors. So what we did was that we collaborated with nurses and doctors in Mexico, and we collected ultrasound images of breast cancer. So my task was to create a deep learning model, a computer vision model that can classify these images as malignant breast cancer tumors or not. A very difficult problem to solve and uh, just being able to work on this gave me a lot of satisfaction. Uh, the whole idea was can we reduce the amount of images that the doctors can go through so that we can save their time and also the next step is to take a mammogram to make sure if you have a cancer or not and that's super expensive. So can we cut down the number of cases that goes to that mammogram analysis. So I worked on that for almost like uh, six to eight months and that really spiked my interest and that interest led me to my current job. Uh, so, you know, can I have the visuals, please? So I worked on mostly natural language processing and computer vision tasks. And currently it's all, it's all working in the public domain and we are trying to work with a lot of different clients. And most of them are kind of like government people and the state administration. And the whole idea is to, how do you reduce human suffering and save lives using AI? So can you guys see the visuals or is it? Sorry, I think there's some technical issue. I guess we have some technical glitch uh, out there. We're not getting the visuals, but uh, that's, that's cool. I mean, Krishna, if you could just explain as well, you know, what you do along with so, it. So basically what we try to do is that we develop uh, image classification and object detection and tracking algorithms. And it's kind of a mix of computer vision, AI and physics. So what we do is essentially we track vehicles. We try to identify their color and their model and we analyze their trajectories. And based on that, we can pick out events of interest uh, on the intersection. So maybe there's a crash happening, maybe there's a drunken driver, maybe there is like a wrong way driver. And all this information is vital in the, with respect to the safety of the people. So in case if there is a crash happening, we send that information fast to the first responders like the 911 call center or maybe directly to the police or the firefighters and all that stuff. So they can come to the scene much earlier. We can maybe save a few minutes and cases like this, a few minutes can mean like the difference between life and death. And as you guys know, this is like pretty hard problem to solve. So we rely on a lot of simulation data as well. So we work on interesting simulation scenarios. We try to replicate what happens in the street and we you know, run our algorithms on that to verify that. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much my life right now and my work. It's pretty cool. I'm super fortunate to work in this field. Thanks Krishna. 
for sharing all that. So that is very interesting. Let's also hope that it, this hits our land pretty soon so that we can say goodbye to the chaos on the streets. Shajan, I have a question for you, but you know, before I start with you, Shajan, I have a trivia for the audience. In fact, uh, Shajan was one of the junior most members uh, defining C Sharp, you know, a programming language that went on to revolutionize the world of IT. Uh, Shajan, as a young programmer, you had the opportunity to work with some of the best legends at Microsoft, and then you had an amazing career after that too, and you're an ML engineer at Twitter right now. Could you please share your journey with us? Yeah, um, sure. So being part of the C-Sharp team and being the junior most member of the team kind of helped me learn from the best in the industry. So I, I, learning you know, has been a constant theme in my career. I, I've been programming and uh, been in the industry for a very long time. I started out with working on computer networks. So computer networks is uh, the piece of software that helps your computer talk to other computers. Like if you're on your cell phone, there is software on your cell phone that helps you, your phone talk to other um, servers and other services. So I started with computer networks, then went into programming languages and programming languages where you, where this is how you communicate with your, a programmer communicates with the computer. Like it, you have to tell the computer, like these, these are the steps to do to make something happen. And that's programming language. So after that, I went into, what's called distributed systems and cloud computing. Um, so I'll explain this. So there are problems in computers um, where the problem is so hard that a single computer cannot solve a problem. So you need a set of computers. Uh, sometimes you need thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers to solve a problem. So writing software that um, helps solve problem, you know, large problems like this is called distributed systems. So I worked on that. And uh, you might imagine if you have hundreds of thousands of computers, you cannot put them in your office. You need to uh, put them in a place where there is enough power. So you need to work with the electric company to make sure like there's sufficient power available. And you put those computers in a warehouse. Um, and this warehouse is called a data center. And uh, this whole business of putting computers somewhere else and working on it is called cloud computing. So I worked on that. Um, so uh, after that, I moved on to machine learning. That's what I'm working on right now. So the way I describe machine learning is, um, so when I started off with programming language, you got to tell the computer like everything, every little instructions uh, uh, that it needs to do. So to do that, you need to come up with a set of rules to solve the problem. But there are some problems where you just cannot come up with rules to solve the problem. Like for instance, how do you come up with the rules for you know, driving a car by itself? Uh, recognizing a face. Uh, these are kind of problems where you just cannot kind of program it. That's where machine learning comes in, where you you show a lot of examples of, hey, here's you know uh, how you uh, recognize a face, uh, things like that, and the computer software will kind of figure out the rules, and that's machine learning. Wow, awesome. That's thank thank you, Shajan. It's just amazing to see how you've transitioned from one technology to another, and you know kept yourself hands on. About the you know the whole of your career you know that's that's very interesting. Now, uh, Basant, uh, over to you next. Um, a PhD in computer science from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, a very reputed institution, uh, and you also led a team of uh, 400 plus uh, while you were in Symantec, and you're now leading from the front as uh, CEO at uh, Coriolis. I'm I'm very curious to you know hear the kind of work that you do. We are a services company that works primarily in the domain of storage and security, mm -hmm. encrypting file systems, role or attribute based access control and the like. Thought it might be interesting to say that while Shajan and I have worked in similar areas, we reached there differently. I too worked on massively parallel processing, distributed computing and designer language, but got there purely from the academic side. Mm -hmm. My area of focus now, however, is to look at scaling management without managers. We are a little over a hundred, and handle our affairs with just tech leads. And core to succeeding in that is keeping people focused on challenging goals. That is as good a segue as any to show you something interesting we did in our spare time. Pretty sure you know what fishing is, but here's a fishing tale with a different kind of bait. Surprises are not always nice. You've heard the drill. To safely browse, check the cert and match the site, we must. 
but almost never do we actually verify that while browsing. It is simply too cumbersome. How then do we make browsing safe for grandma? We built Spotfish, a browser extension that uses ML techniques to analyze a page one is viewing and identify the branding there, and then matches that to the certificate aside presence to automate safe browsing. Shan't bore you with the details. Google it if interested. <laughs> that, was, that was truly insightful. Basant, but you know, that's a very relevant slide, especially during these times that uh, we live in, because this was a major discussion last week, you know, where a senior journalist from a reputed media agency was, you know, again, a victim to phishing attack over a particular job offer from Harvard, which never existed. In fact, she even resigned her job. Um, and eventually this whole, um, you know, uh, job offer turned out to be a fake. Yeah, that was an example of spear phishing. Okay. And it kind of gives you an idea of the extent of damage that can happen. All right. Well, Isaac, I want to ask you the next question. All right. So you've had a fabulous track record of over 20 years in the IT industry, working for large brands that people can only aspire to be a part of. Could you help me through this journey? Sure. So uh, I've been working predominantly in the uh, AIML data science field. Uh, and uh, I started off as a chemical engineer, nothing to do with IT. But I've uh, also done a little bit of coding to start with, then got an MBA and worked in uh, multinational companies as a business analyst. And uh, I had a mentor who urged me to try out the so-called field of data analytics uh, first. You know, it was not called data science back then. And uh, I just got hooked onto it. I mean, luckily I had uh, uh, good seniors who could guide me and uh, also some good opportunities at clients. Uh, so that really helped me. Um, and, and I've never looked back and I've always stuck to this field uh, uh, since then, right? Um, uh, mostly in, uh, uh, you know, the focus has been on retail, CPG logistics and supply chain, but, uh, you know, uh, one-off projects in other fields as well. But this is my core area of focus. And... Uh, a little bit of optimization, some predictive forecasting, uh, deep learning, computer vision. These are areas that I've uh, focused on across the years. And I've also had the chance to work in uh, multiple geographies and uh, different sizes, starting from startups to uh, large companies. So uh, that's been my journey. Thanks, Isaac. That's, that's great. But before we move on, I want to talk to you about something because I was very interested to know that you found a way to infuse technology with a popular sport like cricket. And now I know like there are many of us in the audience are cricket fans. So we are just eager to know more. Sure. Uh, actually, I was uh, more of a basketball fan, uh, thanks to Loyola. And uh, this is something that I did uh, fairly early in my career uh, when I got into data science. Uh, maybe if we can have the slide up, please, Benoit. So what we did was we tried to predict the outcome of matches live uh, using uh, live feeds like CrickBuzz and CrickInfo and all that. We used to get that live feed and uh, get the numbers crunched in a real time. And we had a predictive uh, model built for uh, ODIs as well as T20s. And the ball by ball, you could see that uh, the needle out there swinging. It'll, it would show the uh, percentage of uh, the, the probability of victory. Rather. And uh, we had... Uh, data at a player level, all historical data, all the games that were played. Um, it seems probably about 10 years ago that we built this. Um, and it had country level, player level, and ground level inputs. And uh, we were able to test it against such proven methods. So one interesting thing we did was to benchmark it against Duckworth Lewis. So we took matches where we knew the end result and stopped it uh, at, say, 35th over or 40th over. And say what uh, Duckworth Lewis would predict as the winner and uh, what we would uh, say as the winner. Um, and the, uh, the key difference was back then Duckworth Lewis used only the resources left, right? It was uh, the number of overs left or the number of wickets left to find out what is the probability of victory. So having uh, wickets left is not the same if you have Sachin left and Srishanth left, right? So our model had the player level in inputs. And uh, we hit about 88.5% accuracy. Um, it's about 2.5% more than uh, what Duckworth Lewis was able to get. Um, I got hooked onto it, uh, analytics and data science, uh, you know, because of some 
uh, interesting projects like these and uh, i wish we knew what, you know when they taught us in school about uh, you know the maths and stats part you know i wish uh, what the power of such predictive analytics could give and i probably i would have paid more attention in class well uh, you know i think hearing you i i think if you had something better than duckworth lewis to offer the south africans would sure have loved you guys more especially in the 90s sure so uh, abhijit uh, you know the next question and as a child you you spoke that you dreamt about english literature and you know you, you used to write um and now you're working in a niche company uh, microsoft a niche ai team in microsoft if i can put it that way you tell us about the transformation that that you had and maybe also about something interesting in in terms of a project that you've executed recently yeah thanks aj and uh, that's right english lit was my passion back in high school and the then my then english teacher at loyola mr pratap chandran was responsible for like finding that flair in me uh, but unfortunately i fell into the whole rat race of like engineering versus medicine which is like prevalent in our society today and that led me to um, a bachelor's degree in engineering at uh, bits goa campus and pretty soon i realized that um, you know i wasn't exactly like interested in what was going on there so it was like a very difficult four years uh, following that but then at the end of those four years i just pure by pure chance just fell into uh, an internship uh, more of like a data analytics focused internship at uh, musigma in bangalore um which is where i'm actually like learning the words like data analytics data science machine learning etc and like knowing what they are and all of a sudden all the complex mathematical equations that i learned in college which made absolutely no sense at the time suddenly started making sense in context and that's when i realized that i do have like a passion for it and i'm actually good at this and this is something that i can do for my career um but then at that point i had like nothing to show in my profile for the, for my interest um except this like one internship experience that i had so for the next 2 3 years i basically spent like juggling like multiple positions together everything to do with uh, data science in some form or the other uh, just to sort of like build a profile of mine and uh, while building that profile i got to understand that i am in need of mentorship um just like what isaac was saying before uh and then it was really difficult to get that mentorship because of the fact that i had nothing to show in my profile so then because i was so focused on getting my mentorship since i needed to be shown like a better direction for whatever i was doing i decided to apply for a master's degree specifically in data science and that's what got me to harvard and um, that's what eventually got me to microsoft which is where i've been right now for like a year and a half in the ai division um I've had the good fortune to work on a lot of different kinds of projects across a lot of different domains in data science. Um maybe I can talk to you about like one of the projects that I did in 2018. Uh Binay if you can have the visual up right now. Um thank you. So I basically did this project with the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. It's Mount Sinai is like one of the major hospital networks in New York. Uh you can think of as like a counterpart of like Apollo in India. Uh, but in, here in the US major hospital networks all have their own research divisions and this is a project that I did with one of the research divisions of Mount Sinai. Uh basically uh we're looking at the country called Guatemala and uh, Guatemala is a Latin American country. It's a third world country and they have a lot of problems with um mosquito borne illnesses um and then if you are looking at like a data approach to solving this problem you actually need data regarding like disease statistics and disease prevalence and all that which is usually very difficult to get in a country like guatemala where data maintenance and data security is like considerably poor because the priorities are like elsewhere obviously um so we had to sort of like innovate we had to find out a way to like repurpose data that was meant for some other purpose in order to like solve this particular problem so basically we saw that we had a we had like a set of uh, survey images which were taken by drones which is basically like a drone flying at a almost constant height and like clicking images like every few seconds over guatemala city and we saw that there were a lot of like abandoned tires like spread all across the images and we hypothesized that um when rainwater rainwater actually collects in those abandoned tires and it acts as like a breeding site for mosquitoes so if you are able to like remove those abandoned tires uh it would be like it would be it would make the health situation better but then uh, in a when when the abandoned tires like spread all across where 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 do you even like start removing those abandoned tires was a big question so we actually like made like a machine learning model a computer vision model which could look at these images and automatically draw like bounding boxes across a bounding boxes around those abandoned tires so that the officials know exactly where to go and um, remove those abandoned tires now one interesting thing that happened here is that 
especially when you actually when you're in school and when you're studying like almost everything you keep asking yourself why am i studying this right i also asked myself that uh, when i studied trigonometry in like i think 7th standard or something like am i going to use trigonometry to go to the grocery store like no definitely not then why am i even studying this but then fast forward like 12 years or 13 years later came this project and we had to know the height at which the drone was flying to dis- make decisions regarding the resolution of the bounding box and everything and we had like no information regarding the height so we noticed that uh, there were like trucks there were a lot of trucks that we could see in these images so we actually did a quick search uh, we found out the largest commercial trucks available in guatemala uh, took out their dimensions compared their actual dimensions to the dimensions in the image and reverse engineered it using trigonometry to estimate the height or height at which a drone was flying and by doing that we also found out that the drone might have been flying illegally above the permitted height according to guatemalan law which was actually really interesting oh wow you know that's a it's a very simple but clear explanation and in fact uh, students if you are listening get your trig hats on because it's definitely going to help you in future if you choose this path uh, by the way uh, abhi do you still write literature uh, as a hobby like here and there i might uh, do some poetry poetry is okay. like what i like the best so when i when i to get take a break from something i usually write some kind of poetry okay all right all right so let's let's move on to um you know chasing some dreams uh, so it's it's more about getting to know our panels a little more better over to you vivi yeah so there is something that i've been wanting to ask isaac and abhi so you see my batchmate and i are very lucky to have access to ai classes taught by father principal himself we have been introduced to the basics of neural networks and tensorflow already and i was thinking maybe you could talk about something similar and interesting definitely and it's it's uh, very heartening to know that you're already doing uh, ai ml courses uh, in school um these have been around for quite some time neural networks have been around but it's just that we didn't have the kind of hardware to crunch the numbers for say a deep learning network right or uh, enough data to train models uh, so uh, you know things were a little slow uh, but of late especially in the image recognition space and and in multiple other application right, things have really started heating up there are tools free tools open source tools you can just pick up from somebody's github repository and just uh, get some quick results so uh, i've also had uh, the fortune to get some of these in production uh, for quality checks you know fresh fruit uh, you know if they get bruised uh, how do you get to uh, to identify the damaged ones and you know uh not uh, you know get them into the supply chain uh, discard them right before uh, you take them in so uh, lots of uh, interesting applications one of the things that uh, we uh, have tried out is a, a, a neural style transfer it's one of the uh, newer areas what you do is you take a picture and you take some other style so the content from the first picture and the style of the second picture and merge the two and as if uh, you know it's a blend of the two um, i can show you a few examples right now uh, binay can you just put up the visuals please um so took one of our favorite topics out here uh, let's take the lala school crest and you may already know the vincent van gogh starry nights uh, picture and this is what our school crest would have looked like if vincent van gogh had painted it and another one closer to home would be uh, raja ravi varma's uh, uh, picture and this is what uh, it would have looked like uh, yet another one is sena fusain's uh, lady with the veena and uh, you can see the school crest for the new gen folks i've got uh, a few among us creations of the loyola school crest and also possibly you'll recognize this one uh, my kids knew this one so uh, this is a clash of clans and uh, of course money has how uh, where can we go without money has right so uh, this is probably a, a simple application and all the uh, the tutorials are out there uh, on the net youtube video tutorials uh, the code is available i just uh, we just had to do some tweaking around and playing it, uh, to get produce these results uh, abhijit would you want to add on anything please yeah, thank you isaac so one one interesting application of the neural style transfer that which actually came out in one of my conversations with someone in new york actually during the same time as my internship where i did the previous project um so the the company was actually focusing on like home renovations like interior interior decorations and interior renovations um so one of their ideas was to actually use neural style transfer to actually show customers what their uh, bedroom or living room would look like in different styles so if you actually want to if the customer one needs to make a decision these days you know they actually have to like show like a model of like what 
what their room would look like in future. So they had to like actually put in uh, physical furniture and physical decorations and everything to actually create that model and show customers. And they they might even just look at it for one second and be like, hey, I don't like it and I don't want that. And they had to like change it all over again. So they were actually looking at the possibility of using neural style transfer as like a solution for this, wherein they'll actually take in images of like different kinds of like bedroom. For example, if if you want to like show your customer what their bedroom is going to look like in like in like a Victorian style, they'll take an image of like a Victorian bedroom, use neural file transfer to transfer the image of the customer's current bedroom into a Victorian style and they can show them. And the uh, customer doesn't like it, that's cool. You just like delete that image and take in another style, do the same thing and just show that image to get to them later. So like I, I thought it was like a very innovative application neural file transfer. And uh, Neural cell transfer is obviously like a computer vision approach and the computer vision has like a lot more applications outside of this as well. One, one of them is what Krishna was like talking about earlier. And um, for those sports fans out there, some of my colleagues at Microsoft are actually working on uh, live player tracking during football matches uh, to actually understand, to auto actually automatically understand um, which player is tired and need to be switched out. Uh, and they're actually like directly working with like a club in the German Bundesliga at the moment. And um, another project that I've heard of being talked about and I've talked about is um, using it as like a solution for uh, detecting distracted driving. So have like a camera facing the driver while the driver is driving and uh, sort of like detect the driver's actions and automatically identify whether when the driver is distracted from driving to maybe sort of like sound an alarm or something to just to like you know, jerk the driver into attention back again. So there are like a lot of extremely, extremely interesting and impactful applications going on for computer vision and a lot of other fields as well. Thank you, that was brilliant. Those, my, those visuals were mind boggling. Isaac and Abhijit, I'm still mesmerized, yeah. Hey, uh, Krishna, uh, let me come over to you. And, uh, you know, I have, I wanted to ask you um, a question, which is, uh, let's, let's address a sensitive topic here. You know, the question is to address a typical problem that is uh, prevalent, at least in India. And it's, it's about this salary package culture. It's something that I know you despised. And uh, as someone who has defied conventions, what prompted you to quit a high paying job in a large company, do your masters and then go and join a, a very new startup? Uh it's pretty interesting question. So, you know, when I was in like 11th and 12th, I used to see all this new news, all this news about like, you know, IIT placement days and people getting hired for really big, like really, really large, ridiculous amount of money in big companies. And honestly, at that point, I even I wanted to, I wanted to like get up, get into a big company, get that a lot of money and I thought it would be fun. And honestly, I don't think there is anything wrong with it. I'm saying it's like, hey, big companies are good for some people. And money is always good. There's nothing wrong with chasing that either. But uh, what I have to say is that it's not necessarily good for everyone. And you don't have to necessarily do it in that order. Like you don't have to like get into a, like a big, you know, the tire one colleges and then immediately after graduation, get a job in a big corporate with a huge sum of money. And if you don't do it in that order, it's not necessarily a failure. So this is strictly my personal story. And for me, I went to a relatively good college uh, and I was lucky enough to find a good high paying job in Bangalore just after I graduated. Uh, it was a big, well-known corporation. And initially I liked it, the money was good and I enjoyed my Bangalore life. But pretty soon I felt it was kind of boring. It was not at all challenging. And I felt like I was just sitting there and just wasting my time and I wanted to do something interesting. And I also understood that I didn't have the necessary skill set to like change my career at that point. And that's when I realized that, hey, maybe now it's the time to like just quit it. and pursue something that I really enjoy because I, I felt that, you know, it's like slowly I'm like slipping into some kind of like a sedentary state. And if I get too comfortable, I'm gonna get stuck here. And that kind of scared me a lot, uh, but it's different for different people. Like even now, if you look at Abhijit, he's working for one of the biggest corporations on the planet, like Microsoft, but he didn't like go there immediately. He worked in a bunch of startups. He kind of figured out his way and eventually landed up there. So I'm not saying that big companies are bad and it's not like, you like everyone who directly joins a big companies doesn't suffer. Uh, there are a lot of my friends who work in big companies are entirely happy about it. And there are some advantages to it, but just because you don't get into an IIT now and doesn't mean that it completely like cuts off your chance of ending up in a good field and, and getting like a high paying job or whatever you want. So that's my story. Thank, thank you, Krishna. I, I think I, uh, that's a very, very interesting uh, response. And I really appreciate your candid view. 
and i'm sure the students are listening and so are the parents because it's an absolutely uh, beautiful perspective that you brought in moving on i want to talk to shahjan for a little bit here so shahjan as you already probably know v gen z is all about online gaming is the new entertainment after all and we have a very young crowd here and i'm sure many can relate to zynga the gaming company where you were leading a division so we'd love to hear more about that yeah uh, working on a working on a gaming company is a lot of fun um so the best part is that you get to play games and uh, you get paid for playing games uh, we have a full session coming up on uh, gaming uh, in march so let's let's talk more about it in that session but it it's really fun okay getting paid to play games sounds like a lot of fun uh, you know you just gave me a throwback to like prince of persia i can see isaac smiling uh, <laughs> nintendo console and you know the super mario graphics and things and it just 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 put me on a throwback mode all right so basant uh, i have a question for you and this is uh, basically regarding higher studies because we have a fairly young crowd out here uh, you know you chose the academia life and uh, you had a fairly long stint at this wonderful institution um, tata institute of fundamental research in fact for the audience um, basant did his post doctoral studies at uh, kifr for 8 years and he was working for semantic on weekdays and he pursued his passion on weekends doing his research and this was between mumbai and pune if i'm not mistaken so basan what's your advice to one who plans uh, to pursue their higher studies or let's say like in your case uh, chase a phd i have been asked that a number of times aj and i have two disjoint answers to it to those pursuing higher studies as a means to an end better job prospects emigration and the like stay focused on your goal and endure but to those who pursue it for love make sure you're truly passionate about it and every milestone along the way however arduous will be a reward in itself still remember the relief after three straight sleepless nights of meeting the submission deadline for my first paper pursuing a phd is also a journey of self discovery sprinkle liberally with self doubt just a word of caution though rest assured there will always be someone better than us out there and that isn't a bad thing all right so thank you thank you so much bus and i'm i'm sure that answer would kind of benefit a lot of members in our audience seeking higher studies well now that we've heard about chasing some of these dreams and uh, some of the finer details regarding your work i mean let's go a little light here yeah so i want to ask each of you a question here so when you look back today tell us about a fun moment or maybe an inspiration story or an event that left a long lasting impact from school what does loyola mean to you so let's go one by one starting with maybe aj uh, i'm oh. going to give you a chance to answer a question here okay so uh, thank you thank you vivi so I, i can probably you know divide that into two parts and my my first answer would be that in uh, you know, a loyola to me is um, you know like uh, what father uh, anikuri said once it's a freedom to express But in hindsight when i look back um, in hind- you know, nothing helped more than those speeches delivered during assembly sessions and it was an amazing confidence booster and i can i can share an example which is uh, you know in the recent past i met the senior loyalite from 87 batch you know i had never met him in school uh, we connected randomly in linkedin a few years back and again because of the school group being a common factor and this was when you know we just started off uh, the company and we were pretty clueless on how to go about building the organization and, you know from then till date the amount of help advice guidance uh, mentorship that i have received from this person you know absolutely selfless uh, you know it's it countless number of times uh, has he helped me and i once asked him i was very curious and i asked him why would he do that for me and he said it's just kinship so what i realized is that the power of this alumni is just unbelievable and my experience is no different in loba across batches across geographies and the brotherhood way you can just cut through ages and talk the same language that's just amazing for me so so that's that's what it is for me if you, if you ask me thanks for that dj it truly is amazing i say what about you uh loyla to me uh, you know it's all about the work ethics and you know how do you uh, behave, behave professionally and one of the things i picked up in lalo was you know how to focus and you know get attention to detail uh, there's a little bit of an embarrassing story i might want to share here so uh, hindi was never my strong point uh, and you know during one of the exams 
I had a uh, uh, an essay type question. So that's usually where everybody gets stuck. Uh, I was scratching my head. Uh, you know, I saw one of my um, classmates looking on the wall. Saw the uh, you know Nehru picture and all that. And he was writing furiously. So I said, okay. So the topic was uh, Balidan. And then okay, I got inspired. Okay, I saw the leaders on the library wall. I wrote, okay, Nehru ne Balidan kia. Gandhi ji ne Bali Dhan ke blah 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 and figured out how to fit that sheet with some five uh, sentences. Came out of the exam hall and then to my horror, I realized that it was not Bali Dhan. The topic was Bal Din and he was looking at Nehru's picture and writing because of that. Okay. Well, bottom line: stay focused, give attention to details, and this will actually probably help you in your exams. Don't be in a hurry. Read the question, understand it, and respond. Okay, and, and, and I'm sure that will stay with me a long time in my professional life as well. That, that is hilarious, Isaac. It's also very important. So thank you, uh, Krishna. What about you? Well, coming to Lahore, there are like obviously a lot of stories and inspiring things my teachers show me and everything. But I, I pick something that's like a, maybe kind of embarrassing story, but. So every time someone asks me about AI and ML, I tell them like, "Hey, you know, focus on your math, do your stats, and all that stuff." Uh, but I joined Lyle in fifth, and that year my math actually completely sucked. Uh, I used to dread the Thursday afternoons because we had two math periods, and uh, we have tests there. I think this is like an oral exam, like uh, like the teacher would ask you questions and you had to answer that. And for some reason, I never got math. I never couldn't really understand what I was studying in math at that point. Uh, and I think maybe 60% of the time I used to be like, the teacher would be like, get out. And on, uh, I would be spending the afternoon like outside the class, looking at the trees move and kind of chilling there. But on strike three, you had to go to vice principal and get that uh, remarks on your diary. Then there's the awkward moment of going back home and showing it to your dad. Uh, but you know, thinking back, it's really fun. But my teachers were actually pretty kind too. You know, after a while, they sat down with me and asked me, you know, how things going and they kind of figured out I was a very quiet guy, probably because I joined Loyola at that time. But then finally in sixth and seventh, I started picking up and things went well. So looking back, it's kind of funny because I'm working in one of those big fields, but actually math is important. And I came from that background. Thanks, Krishna. That, that is a good story. Your turn, wasn't? Okay. I got thrown out of class in the sixth. Moral science, no less for starting 10 sentences about God with what God. Father Varki and I had a 20 minute discussion at the end of which he made me a deal I couldn't refuse, allowing me to either do arrow modeling or be at the library during moral science class for the rest of my days in Loyola. So that was it for me. It showed me what Loyola was, freedom of expression and thought. Well, Vasan, that's a really nice anecdote. It's really interesting. Let's move to Abhijit now. Uh, Abhijit, I think you're on mute. Um, yeah, so one quality of mine that I, that I still keep on today is like punctuality. If I'm told to be there by seven, I usually am there like 10 to 15 minutes early and that applies almost everywhere in my life. And I'd like to think that I actually came from like a pretty scarring incident back in uh, ninth standard. Uh, this during the excursion, I think it was to OT or something. Um, and then uh, we were actually let out in groups to sort of uh, explore the town for a little bit. And uh, we were all told to be back in the town center by like, maybe like 12 noon or something so that we could like go back to the bus together. It was like Ramesh and sir was the one who was the faculty leading the entire thing. And um, we went went out together and we happily strolled around the town as a group, uh, came late, didn't reach there at 12. We reached there at like 12, five or 12, seven or something. Uh, didn't see anyone there, obviously. We automatically assumed that everyone would have like gone back to the bus. and. One thing that baffles me right now is that I wasn't even scared at that time. I don't know why. I should have been like really scared, but I wasn't scared. Um, we None of us were scared. And then we were like, again, like happily strolling back to the bus as if like nothing really happened. Um, while at there, at the bus, everyone was like freaking out. These like six kids are like nowhere to be found. Uh, and then after a while, we see like Ramesh and Sir like walking back to, towards us from the direction of the bus. And we were like happily walking towards the, towards the bus. 
and uh, we saw him we didn't again we didn't get scared but like after he was like he came really close to us he just like exploded on us like right in the middle of the town center everyone was like watching the entire town center was like looking at us because he wasn't really caring who was looking he was just, like actually absolutely shouting at all of us in the middle of the town center and uh, later because of that one incident because we got late um the entire the entire batch who went to the excursion which is like four buses worth of kids didn't get to uh, do the malambura rope way because that was the next stop uh, because we got late because of the six kids who got everyone late so ever, ever since then i i'd like to think i've actually like 10 to 15 minutes early for absolutely anything in my life hey, thanks obviously that's a very good story yeah last but not the least let's move to shahjan here um yeah um so for me it was failing in third grade um, so if you can if you can believe it i failed in third grade and uh, my parents were really nice about it like they said like oh that's not a big deal you know this happens but i knew like i knew i failed <laughs> i failed like really bad um so i had to repeat the same year the good part of that is it kind of taught me how to deal with failure like at a very young age and um, after that like anything you know anything that goes wrong i i kind of compare it with failing a grade and it's not a big deal um so parents if you're listening you know, it's very important to you know to uh, when you when your kid fails in a class or anything like that you know it's not a big deal at this age you know it's probably a good thing you know boost their confidence um you know learning to fail is a big big thing thank you shashin there was a powerful message here and that was so fun and insightful i loved it but aj can we talk about fear now yes uh, so so career guidance is not just about technology and the latest buzzwords you know it's also about like shajin said it's also about overcoming setbacks uh, you know failures and areas of improvement so so let's talk about the the fear of failure and in in my opinion um, it's not rather in my opinion but i would say that fear stands for either forget everything and run or face everything and rise over to you vivi once again let's start with krishna so today is all about career guidance and mentoring and if i recall krishna you wanted to talk about setbacks in your career and the importance of a coach to guide you it would be lovely to hear more about that uh thanks vivi so uh, when i look back to my high school and area career days i think there are like two crucial points where i wish i had like a real mentor to like go and and ask questions about stuff so one was right after high school and i was also on that same bandwagon of like get into iit and it kind of things and i didn't go there but get into iit and it and i was partially disappointed by it too but i still went to a good college but there was a question of what major i should choose and honestly i knew i like building stuff but i and i loved to code uh but i was kind of hesitant to make a decision on my own and obviously like asked uh, whoever i could like all the elders and stuff but there were no engineers in my family so there is not someone i can really be close to and ask a lot of specific questions so a lot of people told me like don't go to computer science because it industry is very unstable it's pretty new don't do all that stuff and they told me like go to civil electrical or mechanical and this are like more classical engineering fields and stick to that there is nothing wrong with those fields like if you love it just pursue that but it wasn't for me and i thought maybe you know i don't know enough maybe these people are older they know all this stuff so i believe their intentions were really good and they really wanted to the best for me but i took that advice and i took electrical engineering uh four years of college the only thing i remember from that is uh digital circuits embedded systems and microcontrollers all to do with programming and uh electronic stuff and all the other stuff like transformers and power systems and all that cla- the true core electrical engineering stuff i have no idea i completely forgot that so at the end of those four years again the big confusion of where do you want to go like you kind of passed all the exams but you're not a good electrical engineer and i knew that i know i'd have to code and somehow i ended up in oracle uh which is a company i first worked with and this is a great company and uh i worked in databases and i don't know why they selected me for databases because i never worked on a database before and again the same confusion of like what am i doing here and the and the work was a little bit boring uh and it was super comfortable though like you come at 9 you leave at 5 it's like a very relaxed job you're in bangalore all your friends are here it's so, so much fun but i felt that if i stick on here it's going to be that set for me uh i was getting too comfortable and i see some of my other friends who work for smaller startups doing like pretty awesome things 
they're getting paid half of what I'm getting paid, but their work is so much more interesting to me. And I finally realized that I have to change. Like, it's not about money and the money is not making me happy. And my family was very supportive about this as well. And uh, I realized that I don't have the skills to change my job right now. Uh, and the only way I could do was like, take a chance, leave the job and uh, no, maybe find a very small startup and start from scratch. Or we didn't have a lot of internet resource or LinkedIn to reach out to people at that time too. So I was hesitant to do that. And I stuck on to that job for a year and a half. Some, even some of my colleagues like quit within a few months because they felt bored. I stuck on to one and a half years because I was fear of losing that safety net, fear of losing the being, uh, getting a job in a big company, fear of losing the money and a lot of things. But finally I decided this is enough's enough and I hit the reset button. I decided to pursue my master's in computer engineering, which I thought would be a light, nice blend of electronics and uh, electronics and programming, but still didn't have a clue about data science. So I went there, but I made sure this time that I'm only going to pursue the things that I really, really interested in. So I sit in classes, I attend a few lectures, see if I can understand it, see if I want to like pursue it further. And I choose all of my courses carefully. I made sure that I make calculated risk as I go, but uh, at the end it kind of paid off. But that fear was always there. And every step along the way, when I decided to change my career, I was afraid of thinking that hey, maybe I did something stupid. I should end up let go of my job in India. But at the end, I stuck onto it. And so far, I kind of worked out well. That was fantastic, Krishna. Uh, I see your point, And I totally agree with you on how a good coach can make a really big difference. And when, since you're talking about coaches, uh, you know, we have Shajan here, who is also a, a powerlifting coach in the US national team. And Shajin, you were pretty famous in school for sports too. I mean, basketball, captain, athletics pro. Uh, you still continue to be very active in the circuit. So, so tell me something. You coach students on ML concepts and you also coach athletes in powerlifting at what is possibly the highest levels out there. Um, and, and sports is also about uh, you know, a lot of failures, right? I mean, you don't win all the time. So as a coach, what's your experience? What's your observation and, and what would be some of those traits that you would look to have somebody in your, your team? Yeah, uh, surprisingly, sports is uh, very helpful, you know, developing you as an individual. Uh, one good thing that sports does for um, team building is it helps you become a good team player. And that's highly valued in, a, in an industry setting, uh, any kind of job you go to. Uh, that's quite important. And as you said, like, it's a safe space to uh, have failures. You know, you're in the sports, you're going to fail sometimes. And uh, how you deal with failure, you learn, you know, you kind of analyze what went wrong, what you can do better, and you get better and move on. Um, so that, that's a very safe space to, to learn about failure. And talking about coaching, um, so a, a few things, a uh, few interesting things I, I learned from coaching at an international level is um, there are standard things like you work hard, you train very hard, um, you have good genetics, um, and you follow the latest research, and that gets you like you know national level. And um, this applies to not just sports; actually, it applies to work as well. It you know it makes you like really good at what you do. However, if you want to be the best in the world, like top ten in the world in athletics or even at your work, then you go beyond the research. You know, a lot of things hasn't been researched yet. So you kind of do your own experiments, figure out what works, try different things. Um, and that, you know, that kind of, it's amazing at, you know, at sports, this is done at an international level. Um, but it, if you think about it, it applies to your work as well. Um, so the other thing is um, teaching itself. Like I, I do teach uh, machine learning for, uh, as a volunteer. Um, um, and one of the things that um, does to you when you teach is it makes you learn things at a deeper level. And, you know, for you students, like, you know, you try, you know, try learning something and then teaching it. Uh, that gives you that extra, um, extra insight that you may not otherwise have. Right. That's, that's very interesting. Shajan, I'm, I'm sure you've gained some fans as well today. And by the way, for the audience, uh, there's a small trivia here. Shajan's daughter is world number three for under 18 and is a part of the U.S. Nationals team for uh, powerlifting. Um, and, and, uh, wasn't there a, a, a nice slogan uh, that, that used to exist while you, while you were on the basketball team um, in, uh, in school? Yeah, I, 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 I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I clearly remember shouting at the top of my lungs, you know, 
uh, you know, it was Unni Shahjar, Bobby, we bring Loyola victory. You know? so I, I remember he was quite a star back then. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Right. So, I said, let me, let me come to you, Rahul. Uh, now, when I looked at your LinkedIn profile and, uh, you know, I, I saw this. I saw Loyola, I saw IIT, I saw IAM. And, and when we spoke, you talked about your experience, um, where you talked about, you know, your experience in Infosys, you know, the data science startup, uh, PwC, Walmart, uh, now at BCG. You even spoke about that opportunity. You got to work with uh, Vishal Sikha directly where, you know, you, uh, he's, a, he's like an AI data science guru, right? So, so there's no way somebody can associate uh, setbacks or failure with your kind of a profile, but you specifically wanted to talk about failures in life and how somebody would go about handling it. So yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think this is very personal to me. Uh, the reason why you know we don't talk about the failures is when you put it in a resume, they're not interested in seeing your failures. They just want to see the bullet points of your achievements, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, in my personal life, I have actually, uh, I wrote uh, the IIT JE uh, and cleared it in the second attempt. And CAT also, I wrote it thrice and then uh, got the calls. So it was not easy. So I specifically want to talk about this, okay? Especially uh, to the young members of the audience. Uh, it's not about uh, failure. You'll fall down, but it's all about picking yourself up and getting back up and trying again. Now, in my case, I uh, did not have pressure from my parents. So this is addressed to all the parents uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, my family did not put any pressure. It was my decision to uh, try again. And actually, I studied uh, you know, for one year in uh, the College of Engineering in Random Hill. My uh, dad was very supportive. Uh, he took me to Chennai. We hunted around for some coaching classes and all that. But eventually, we decided to come back and then uh, try again another time. So uh, the decision was mine. The support came from the parents, and uh, you know there was absolutely no pressure. Uh, but you need to change. The, what I learned from these things is, especially at such an age, right? Uh, you are at a very young age, and uh, if you cannot handle these failures, it's going to be very difficult. So. You have to train yourself. How do you talk to yourself? Prep yourself next time. What is the change in strategy? You cannot try the same thing all over again. It doesn't work. So, uh, and, and also it's all about giving yourself little pep talks, changing things, uh, you know, making sure that uh, you hit the peak at the right time and so on and so forth. So uh, um, all these things go a long way in making sure that uh, you can handle failure in the right way. It's not easy. It's, it's uh, at the time I was devastated, but uh, you know, you get over it and then life has a lot more surprises in store for you. So if you can't handle these, then you know how will you handle the big things in life? So that's the plan. That's that's a wonderful answer. And in fact, it's not easy to talk about failures and as we still view it as taboo. And, and but I'm glad we are all talking about the importance of understanding and overcoming failures. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, let's chat uh, with Abhijit for a minute here. Well, I'm sure Abhijit, you have had a great run till date, but could you recall any setbacks you faced from your journey from Loyola to Bates to Harvard? Maybe could you narrate some of your experiences? Yeah, I would say that up until I saw that Harvard at mid letter, like almost everything was like pretty much a setback and everything did teach me something too. In fact, I have it like tattooed on my arm, uh, progression, not perfection one day at a time. Um, and it, the, all the failures definitely like taught me something to go forward. Uh, I personally consider um, not being able to study English literature as like a setback, first of all. Uh, and then when I got into engineering, it was a very, like a very difficult four years where I wasn't able to really relate to anything that was being taught. Um, and in fact, there was this instance in my, I think it was my fourth semester where I had like four exams in on a single, four one hour exams on a single day. Three of them were some kind of like uh, creative writing or like writing related electives, like uh, creative writing or like journalism or something. And the last one was like a core electronics subject, signals and systems, I think. Um, and the last one was the only one I actually studied for all the writing related uh, subjects. I just like walked in and wrote the exam. Um, and I ended up with like an A grade for, I think, like all three of them and even like topped one of the courses without actually like putting in any work. And then for the subject that I actually studied, I ended up with like a C or a C minus, um, which was actually like throwing more light into the fact that, oh, I should have studied English Lit, but then here I am. And now it's like, it's probably like too late to do anything. Um, and then uh, after that came data science. I, started, I discovered data science. I was like, okay, this stuff suddenly makes sense. Um, but then now the challenge was how exactly do I prove to people that 
hey i actually have an inclination towards i actually have an interest in this uh, i actually have i am actually it's something that I, i can actually do because people wouldn't believe me without something to show then the next two three years was like a massive struggle of like how exactly do i bring in various experiences to actually build my profile to show people which was like honestly like a very very big challenge and my work life balance definitely took a hit i did like a juggle a lot of things together i won't advise anyone else to do that work life balance and mental health are extremely important please don't do what i did but i had to do it at that point in time uh, and then all of that basically uh, led to all these this struggle that stretched across like like maybe a span of 8 uh, to 10 years uh, it was like incredibly challenging for sure right when i thought uh, you know i had i had everything under control something went wrong and i, I had to like restart all over again so and then eventually when the howard admit came um, things started to look up and i came here uh, my experience here has been great it was not without its problems but overall it has been like a wonderful experience i've been in the us for like 3 and 1/2 years now studying plus um, working at microsoft so at the end of the day that's a contrast i want to make like what happened when society made a plan for me versus what happened when i actually made a plan for myself and i think that's like a very very important contrast to make that's pretty interesting yeah thanks for the clear narration of vijay sure. basant um uh, you know we we've always seen this trend uh, where one goes through a lot of peer pressure parental pressure you I know mean, especially at the school and college level and and you have you know we see the trend actually deteriorating um of late uh, because it's too much of peer pressure too much of parental pressure so what's your advice to students and, and parents because you you've had a very long stint um in a in a from in institutions of an academic nature so what's your advice no matter how well we plan our friend murphy often finds a way to throw a spanner in the works consider a corporate takeover that makes one's job redundant overnight what are we really left with seven in spain no that will run out it quickly comes down to what we have within the confidence and that we can overcome to me confidence is the safety net we carry with us 24 by 7 way back in 84 i was one of five opting for plus 2 against common wisdom of the times signing up for a direct phd program sans a safe exit with an mtech was a risky too joining a startup in the 90s was also not the norm neither was giving up management to get back on the tech track nor leaving the comfort and security of corporate employment the switch to entrepreneurship in my early 40s was scary yes zero income for a year is difficult to stomach i remember my brother offering me maggi packets if the need arose i therefore say peer pressure or parental pressure be damn choose to be the shepherd sometimes confidence along with supportive friends and family has been my safety net uh, well that's a, that's a very interesting statement uh, you know that you made that safety net is actually confidence and uh, i think uh, you know so it's a very strong response to uh, all of our audience out here especially the youngsters you know your your confidence should be your safety net and everything else is you know secondary uh, thanks thank you basant now uh, let's also open up uh, for a few questions from the audience um, in fact uh, we have a few questions that has come in and um, i have an interesting question it says ai ml seems to be taking over everything as of now the question is where does it leave the future of ordinary jobs that people who did not make it to the so called elite jobs generally handle also which are the jobs that are likely to be affected most by the ai ml invasion how uh, who wants to go for it uh, basant do you do you want to give it a shot so yeah ai ml seems to be taking over the world but don't despair I means it's not everything that's going to be ai mlized in the next year or two or even five there's going to be a lot of jobs in setting up infrastructure there's going to be a lot of jobs in networking these things will still remain it's just the way we approach problems that change so i don't think there's really a a need to despair on the fact that if i don't make it to the ai bandwagon i'll be jobless um that but that's my take abhilash you got something to add to that well i i i think that's a, that's a good answer in fact uh, i i totally agree with you on that and i don't think it's going to be completely taking away a lot of jobs from people and uh, like uh, krishna said it's it's uh, earlier when he talked about uh, how his company 
uh, uses technology to kind of create a change. Uh, I don't think it's all about taking away jobs. It's just about increasing the awareness and how we can use it for a constructive purpose. I'm, I'm sure that the, the regular jobs would still remain. Uh, and it's not going to be like uh, a harakiri like we're talking about. And uh, uh, I have something to add, if I may, to that. Um, one perspective that we carry at Microsoft here, at least in my team right now, is using using AI to like help people do better. So rather than looking at AI as a replacement to people, uh, we're looking at AI as like something that could form like a symbiotic con connection with human beings to make their job better. I mean, we can always like joke around and say that, oh, the world is going to end by Terminators and Skynet is actually going to happen. But then at the end of the day, uh, the perspective that we are carrying, carrying forward for AI is something that can actually help make people's work easier rather than do that work for them. So I think at the, at the end of the day, completely agree with what you've just said that, um, you know, jobs are going to remain. They're not going to go anywhere. Well, thank you. Thank you, Basant and Abhijit. We, we also have one more question um, that's uh, fail fast and learn from failure, but is there a risk of failing often? And how is organizational culture aligning with this philosophy? So, um, Shajin, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. Like, so when you're doing something uh, in an industry setting, you, you are expected to plan for failure. That is, you want to look out for, so you, that's what experiments are for. So when we do something, somebody has a good idea, like in the, in the field I'm working in, how to make Twitter better, um, someone has a good idea, but it may not work out. And we know that uh, it may not work out. So we're going to have experiments so that before you invest a few million dollars on it, we first try to uh, prototype something or get something out there that we can test. Um, so we test and see if it's working or not. And most of the time it fails actually. And surprisingly, there's a lot of failures and we don't consider that a failure. It's, it's something that we tried and it's part of the process. It doesn't work. We quickly cut our losses and move on. So that, that's failure is kind of expected. If you're not failing enough, that means you're not, you're not trying, you're not pushing the edge. Okay. Thank you, Shajin. Um, in fact, uh, that, that was also pretty interesting. That question was interesting. So wonderful questions. Uh, you know, the, the questions that is coming in is of extremely high quality that I see. Um, let's uh, talk about career paths, advice, and recommendations you know, from the panelists. And I think this is a very important section because it's all about uh, touching on specifics, especially on AI, ML, and IT. So VB, this section is all yours. Go for it. I think you're the one who is you know, more qualified to ask all these questions. Thanks, AJ. So um, let's start with Shajan and I sing this slide. So I remember, Shajan, you wanted to talk about career paths and prerequisites for our young aspirants here. We would love to hear more. Yeah. Um, sure. Like if I can um, see the visuals here. So I'm going to suggest a few personal tri uh, traits that you might have as a student or, or as an individual. And I'm going to make um, a few areas for you to consider, a few career paths for you to consider. So. Uh, like if you are a person who is um, who considers proof, a mathematical proof is more interesting than the actual facts. Uh, for instance, someone tells you, hey, your teacher tells, says the value of pi is 3.14. You know, it's a ratio of the diameter to the circumference of any circle. Um, and you're not happy with that answer. You want to know why, like, why does it even work? What is the mathematical proof that you know, pi is 3.14 or whatever. If you're one of those people, then I'd seriously have you consider a path in a career in research, uh, either in the industry or in, in, in the academic settings. Um, on the other hand, you're, you're happy with pi being 3.14. Your first thought is, how can I use it? How can I make a product out of it? And I like to, you know, make things work. I like puzzles. If you're one of those people, then you want to consider a career in engineering. Um, and, and um, you don't like, let's say you, you're not able to get into a, an engineering um, admission or something like that. You can always become a programmer um, and be really good at it. So there's nothing blocking you from doing that either. And all of these paths are very good careers. You know, there's not one better than the other. It's usually like where you end up and what you, what you do with it. Uh, there's a lot more details uh, later, in this, um, later in this document you can go through. I'll call out a few like, there are some people who are really good at finding faults. Like, let's say, you know, someone showed you an app or a website and immediately you find like 50 things that are, that are um, bad about it. Uh, consider a path in either uh, 
quality assurance or I think on the chat, someone asked about uh, hacking, ethical hacking and things like that. Those are good ideas for you if, you, if, you, if that naturally comes to you. Now I'm gonna talk a few, um, uh, there's gonna be a display about technical areas. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few different areas. Isaac is gonna step in as well. So the major areas are mobile, where you develop apps on either iPhone or um, Android. Then you have front end, uh, where you work on user interface. These are people who create the web pages and the uh, user interface or the things that you see on an app. Then there is backend engineers who work in the cloud and distributed systems. So for, for backend engineers, I'd highly recommend taking a computer science, uh, a computer science degree. And Isaac. Um, yeah, thanks, Rajan. On the data science side, uh, primarily you have uh, the, the three uh, pillars, if you will. Uh, problem solving, knowing how to create a, a structured way to solve problems, that is very important. Um, and the uh, little bit of maths and stats helps. Uh, these days people are getting away without it, but uh, it definitely helps in some situations. And uh, uh, a fairly good amount of love for coding. Um, there are uh, tools that are coming up with uh, just drag and drop interfaces where you don't have to write code, but uh, you know, in general, it helps to have that uh, sort of love for coding. These are the fundamentals, but uh, on top of that, you also have to overlay the domain knowledge in which you're going to apply the, the techniques, right? Uh, for example, that uh, cricket problem that I told you about, the same model will not obviously work for uh, baseball because we have not applied that kind of domain knowledge. Then. And also on top of that, you have to have the ability to do, you know, storytelling. So visualization helps a lot in that aspect as well. Um, as far as the tools are concerned, things keep changing so fast, it's not funny, right? Uh, on, uh, you know, I started off in SaaS, it's a proprietary tool. Um, not too many people use that, it's all open source. So uh, five years later, it was R. Um, and then, you know, now Python's becoming, becoming pretty popular uh, because there are a lot of, uh, you know, especially on the deep learning side, neural network side, um, you know, Python has a lot of libraries. Um, again, uh, the main thing is, from my example, you can take that what you learn is not going to last forever. So have the ability to drop everything, unlearn, relearn, and keep learning new stuff, right? So that's the, um, uh, the main thing about uh, being in this field. Again, on the machine learning part, uh, you know, if you can uh, also look at uh, frameworks like TensorFlow uh, with a backend like Keras or um, PyTorch seems to be uh, more popular these days. It will help you get started faster and scale much faster. Again, bottom line, uh, keep learning. The tool doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, if you can keep picking up new things as and when they come, uh, nothing like it. Thank you so much, Shajan and Isaac. That was very informative, and I'm sure this will be extremely helpful for all of us listening in tonight. I could relate to that because uh, because we have already been introduced to Keras of TensorFlow in our AI classes at school. But now let's turn our attention to Krishna for a moment here. Now, Krishna, I love to code in Python, and as an ML aspirant myself, what would you suggest as some of the prerequisites for a good start? So. As for any coding language, like there are some basics, like you need to understand what's the uh, time complexity, space complexity, and like what are the basic data structures and stuff like that. It's like basic for all coding languages. So that's what I started when I started with Python as well. And learning Python and keeping in touch with it is like a constant process. Uh, there are some aspects of Python sometimes I don't use for a while, then I forget it, then I go back and refer to those uh, my resources again. So for pure coding purposes, I usually refer to websites like Leap Code or HackerRank. They have like interesting coding challenges. I try to solve them. That helps uh, keeping my Python in good shape. Uh, the, all the, uh, the, the important thing is that those kind of coding questions kind of helps you with the interview process in some of the, the when you're interviewing for some companies as well. Uh, there's another website called Real Python, which I found to be really useful. They have some interesting tutorials there about like certain uh, specific things in Python, like uh, this can be from beginner to advanced level. So it, it, it's very flexible. So I love that website as well. But when I look from an industry point of view, I always found that working on side projects, like uh, like maybe designing a smart, smart sprinkler system is more helpful. It kind of helps me think of a system from end to end. Uh, it makes me think about, hey, what's the mechanical component? Who is my customer? Uh, like how user friendly should it be? what kind of data should I sample and all that stuff. And uh, I tried working on a smart doorbell system for a friend of mine. 
it was just a Raspberry Pi and a camera and a VAR motion sensor. But you have to think about like, hey, what angles the sun shining in the evening? Will it affect my camera? Or how do I push a notification to my friend? How do I make sure that all the tiny things won't trigger an alarm and it, he doesn't get annoyed by that? So thinking about systems as a whole, uh, I think is very interesting because the smaller details matter. Certain things we take it for granted, but once you start building it on our own, we kind of think from an engineer's mindset about like how the product should be. And it's not just about AI. Uh, and I think it should nev definitely not should be only about AI. You should think about the other aspects of uh, putting together a product as well. Thank you, Krishna. That helps us greatly because there are some invaluable pointers there that we must pick up on. Moving on to Krishna's batchmate, Abhijit, nowadays there are so many courses available with numerous credible ones, like uh, for example, the ones offered by Harvard, Berkeley, and even IIT. Are there any courses or certifications that are even available online, like Coursera or edX, that you can recommend here for a budding engineer chasing an AI or ML dream? Basically your advice for them. Yeah, it actually depends on what, ex what exactly do you want to do it or how exactly you want to do it. Um, if you're actually looking for a bachelor's in like data science specifically, um, I, there is an IIT that has like started that now in India. And even in the US, there are like a few universities that are like offering bachelor's in data science at the moment. Um, or if you want to like be more generalized during your bachelor's and then focus on data science during your master's, that's usually the track that mo a lot of people like follow right now, including myself, um, which is there are like a lot of like master's opportunities in business analytics, analytics, data science, whatever it is available today all across the globe. Um, and then there's this, uh, there's the PGDBA, the postgraduate diploma in business analytics, which is actually jointly offered by um, I think I, IIT Karakpur, uh, IIM Calcutta and ISI Kolkata. Um, which is actually like, I think one of the first big names that actually made made some kind of like news when it comes to like masters, postgraduate programs, specifically to analytics in India. Um, or if you're, if you don't want to do any of that, if you're actually looking at just pure certifications, uh, there's this organization called INSAFE, which is, which is actually really popular when I was in India with giving like data science classes and certifications. They were, the content was actually pretty good as well. They used to come to the company that I was working at and like teach people data science at that particular point in time. Um, and they had like a tie up with like Carnegie Mellon University as well. And they had like pretty good content there. Um, and then uh, if, if you want like none of that, if, you just, if you're just interested in the knowledge, uh, if you want to like learn more, uh, you can always depend on online courses on Coursera. There's a certification, there's like a whole specialization dedicated uh, to data science, like uh, which I think the name is like Data Scientist Toolbox. It is actually launched by the Johns Hopkins University. It does like some eight or nine courses in there, I think, which is like very, very helpful for me when I started off. Um, and then if you if you learn that and if you get to the point of deep learning, if you want something to focus on deep learning, uh, there's a very famous Andrew Ng's uh, deep learning.ai specialization, which you can go for, which is again, very helpful for me. Uh, it's something that I always like refer back to when I have like questions about deep learning or when my deep learning gets rusty to verify. So at the end of the day, the primary skills, some of them Isaac was actually mentioning earlier, the problem solving approach, uh, statistic, statistical inference, um, uh, when it comes to computer sciences, the distributed computing, which Shajan was talking about, uh, mathematics, linear algebra, multivariate calculus, and even, even the skill of like explaining data science to someone, data science or machine learning to someone who has like absolutely no idea what they are, just it, being able to like convey that in layman's terms, it's also like a very, very, very important skill to have. So it's up to you to sort of like, um, you know, figure out what exactly is the best way for you to like gain all those skills. Yeah, if I may add on to that, uh, Abhijit. Uh, so the last point is very critical. You have to figure out what works for you and especially what style of learning works for you. So I learned a little late in my career that, um, you know, I have very strong preference for visual learning. So uh, while uh, Andrew Ng's course, uh, course is uh, very highly regarded and, you know, uh, everybody respects him for the depth that he brings in, it's very equation oriented and fairly heavy. And, uh, you know, I have a very strong bias towards visual learning. So I go to sites like distro.com and it works for me. So you have to figure out what works for you. If you're a visual learner, there are uh, quite a bunch of things on YouTube that you can use to pick up. Or if you're the kind of person who likes to code and do stuff, machinelearningmastery.com is for you. So there are n number of options. You have to figure out what works for you and that will help you ramp up very, very fast. Thank you, Abhijit. That was some fun and solid advice. Also, thanks, Isaac. You brought in a whole different angle and perspective in there. Yeah. So uh, let me just uh, take over here with uh, 
you know, a question for Basant. And, and I have two questions for you, Basant. So one is um, the ability to articulate is extremely important, especially uh, in the IT world, you know, because we deal with multicultures, multi-ethnicity, people travel back and forth, uh, but they're not taken as seriously uh, as one should. So what's your take on the power of communication? That's my question number one. And obviously the second question is, what's your final message uh, or advice for a young crowd here? Okay. You've just heard a lot of specifics, but before you give in to despair, let me reassure you, parent or ward, the ship hasn't sailed yet. Uh, Binoy, can we have the... Uh, yeah. So let me start with what makes one employable. Can't quite emphasize life skills enough because they form the bedrock of any successful collaborative effort. And yes, technical skills, but notice the first two listed are really life skills. Trust me, you'll get to learn the rest along the way. Moving quickly over to what one should be getting out of school. Being a good human covers integrity, compassion, accountability, dependability, and the like. Miss that, and no one will want to forget work. Be with us. Without the spirit of inquiry, we'll be condemned to follow. The theories we learn, the factoids we pick up, surely will help open doors, but are like garnish. And if we continually, if we can't continually learn, we'll, we'll have no hope of staying relevant, let alone grow. Let me leave you with a set of N commandments, not to be confused with the, the 10. Changing goals, situational awareness, course corrections. Every one of us on the panel recounted having to do it. Trading up might sound selfish, but unless we seek to rise ourselves, we can't help others do so. Recall Shajan's C-sharp experience. IIT or BUST is not a strategy. It's a therapist employment guarantee scheme. Go all in, set your sights on JE, but be prepared to evaluate shortcomings honestly, course correct, and let's face it, maybe change goals. Give the effort your best though, you owe yourself that. Conduct yourself honorably at all times. In this age of social media, nothing is ever off the record. Lastly, you have but one life. Follow your dreams. And should you falter, be sure to pick yourself up, dust off, and press on. May the force be with you. <laughs> you know, Basant, you, you actually spoke like a Zen master. You know, I, I love the, the calm around you when you speak. You know, absolute pearls of wisdom. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Basant. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to add on something here, which we missed earlier. Uh, I know we had a technical glitch for the video that uh, Krishna was trying to do. Binoy, is it possible that we can bring that video back um, and uh, Krishna can possibly explain that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so this is what I'm trying to do currently. So as you can see, all those boxes, it's essentially deep learning algorithms working with tracking algorithms to consistently keep track of the trajectory of those old vehicles. So if we can keep the trajectories and analyze them, we kind of can uh, sort of say what's happening on that scene. So when you look at a 911 center like in America and you see that there are like thousands of cameras. So how do I ask a human to find a crash quickly? So this is where the algorithms come in. You don't have to monitor 5,000 different cameras. You don't have to have like 100 people watching that. But you develop simulations like this. You run your algorithms on top of that you find where the algorithm is going wrong. Like here, you can see the boxes are not consistent. You try to figure that out. You improve your tracking. You even, even work with games like GTA 5 for some of the algorithms. So this was really fun to do because I also got to play games and uh, work on my algorithms as well. So this is essentially my work right now. It's completely on computer vision and how you uh, track vehicles without compromising on people's privacy. That's a very important thing. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Wow, nice. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Krishna. In fact, I'm glad that we could also show that visual because I thought that was quite interesting. And now let's also open up a few questions uh, from the audience. Um, we, we have one question that has come in. Uh, it says, with AI and ML uh, being adopted furiously and sometimes um, without too much thought, what do you feel about uh, the security ecosystem around it? Um, already we have a lot of tech evangelists sounding alarm bells 
Uh, could you kindly shed some light on the regulation is what the question is all about. Um, Isaac, yeah. Isaac or Shajan, uh, one of you. Yeah, l let me start with that. So yeah, we like using uh, any technology, ML or otherwise, you got to be careful or you know you may have security incidents and things like that. And you re really don't want the government regulating you um, on these kind of things. Um, so we do take uh, security seriously and you make sure like your your training um, you're using a AI in a responsible manner. It's quite hard, um, but we take a lot of effort in doing that. Uh, there are some security risks that you can try to beat it by generating inputs. So the training is all about, you know, here's an in here's a question, here's an answer, uh, machine go and learn it, but you can reverse engineer it to come up with questions, the wrong questions that will give you the answer that you want. Um, that, that's a field of research that's uh, ongoing right now. Um, there are ways to dictate it. So right now, the, the, what we do is we try to dictate it when that happens. Um, but it's an interesting area of research. Isaac, okay. do you? Yeah. And Isaac, how, how serious do you think is a threat of Skynet? Well, it, it's not impossible, but then, you know, probably not going to happen in the next couple of uh, years. Uh, well, it, uh, you know, there is a fine balance between uh, what is AGI or artificial general intelligence and, you know, the narrow fields in which, uh, you know, AI is doing very well these days. So everybody talks about, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the AI beating the Go champion of the world. Um, you know, all those things, especially protein folding coming up, these are all things that were supposed to be impossible, but are, these are still very narrow fields, okay? AGI is still uh, some time away. Um, how much of it can we control? It's yet to be seen. There are a, a lot of people who are doomsday prophets. Um, I personally don't think it's going to happen immediately, but obviously you can never rule it out. Wonderful. Th thank you very much, Isaac and Shajan. Um, and thank Thanks you for that question. One thing there. Yeah. I'd like to add that AI is now actually changing the front of security. Now we're using AI to secure systems too. So it's not that AI is just opening up security holes or worries. AI helps us with security as well. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Basant. Uh, that was also interesting. In fact, uh, we have one more question. If we, I believe we are a couple of minutes uh, to the end of the session, but uh, let me just uh, look at one more question if we can take it. So it, it says, how can AI help public policy and behavioral change um, in governments and at the grassroots level? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I, say, I, I believe you had done some work in that field, right? Right, there was, uh, I can't talk about the specific details, but yes, right. uh, policy, uh, government policy, especially in these challenging times like uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, absolutely bang on. Uh, there are predictive models which can talk about the spread of disease, uh, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, decide on a lockdown or how to raise the lockdown in which places. All these things can be done using uh, predictive models on the epidemiological um, side. Um, and that can drive a lot of uh, relevant policies. Of course, uh, other macroeconomic uh, indices are already there. The Department of Statistics is already tracking that. That can be used for um, educational policies. It can be used for um, uh, you know, job pro policies, uh, you know, employment uh, schemes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Basant, you want to add on? Yeah, actually AI is now being used in agriculture as well to figure out what's happening on a large scale with central monitoring for policy making as well as for insurance claims. So there's a lot of stuff happening in a lot of fields um, and the government is actually using some of these technologies. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Isaac and Basant. Uh, over to you, Vibi. Yeah, so before we finish, we'd like your feedback on today's career guidance session. So can I, can I have the third poll question, please? So you'll see another poll question on your screen right now. So please choose your option. And then don't forget to click submit. If you're on your phone, just scroll down and click submit. Uh, it's about how you how do you rate the content of today's session. Uh, maybe we can get the results up in a few seconds now. As you can see, we have done pretty well. So I'm happy with that. Uh, Benoit, can I have the last poll question? So this poll question is about how you rate the panelists. Um, 
as always, you'll see your options and maybe you can select it and then scroll down and click submit. And uh, we'll show the result in about five to 10 seconds more. Yeah. Results should be up in some time. There we go. It's, it's a huge difference. So we're good there. I think we passed um, if you the have exam. more questions, <laughs> yeah, we did. Many thanks for your feedback. And if your question was not fully answered in the panel discussion, please email it to exploreloba at gmail.com. And well, that marks the session end of our session today and the end of the first series of Kerry Guidance Program. It was an absolute joy working with Team Explorer. Well, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we loved interacting with you. And we'll be back soon with more topics on offer. So stay, stay tuned. In fact, uh, in fact, if you have still more questions, please email it to us at exploreloba at gmail.com. And uh, we are also starting a mentorship series. And uh, we will have more of such topics like gaming, um, entrepreneurship discussed uh, in, in starting from February. And that's going to be the second series. So we're really looking forward uh, to having panelists, moderators, again, you know, if you are interested, please do email it to us at uh, exploreloba at gmail.com. And uh, to wrap up the proceedings, last but not the least, for orchestrating and helping us organize tonight's career guidance session, we would like to thank our wonderful panelists today. Some of them have joined as early as 5 a.m., uh, which is incredible. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, Team Loba Explore, the team behind the scenes, especially we've, uh, you know, we've got some uh, amazing talent behind the scenes. Um, I would like to specifically thank the whole of uh, Team Explore, the audience, guests, students, teachers, parents, and uh, Loyola School and Loba. Thank you very much for being a part of Explore. Uh, see you all very soon. Thank you and good night.